Okay, welcome back. Today I'm going to try something new. I'm going to begin a, a series of oh, reviews, playthroughs, um, examples of plays, hopefully complete a game in a reasonable amount of time and a reasonable amount of videos. I'll call these my video logs for lack of an original title. Um, since the, well, I guess it's the 151st anniversary of the Battle of Shiloh, will be coming up here soon in April, I thought I'd dig out the old blue and gray game from SPI and set it up and see about um, playing the game and seeing how it works and just see if we can have a little fun with it. Um, I'm going to try and experiment. I know, that's kind of scary in and of itself. Um, I'm going to use a different type of combat system instead of the old total up the ratio and of attacker and defender and roll a die. I'm going to try something similar to that, but I'm going to include a few more uh, combat results. I'm going to use an article um, from an old SBI Moves magazine that kind of upgraded um, the combat rules for their Napoleon at War series, I believe. Um, specifically, Ilau. Um, they added a little bit more, oh, I don't know how you want to call it, a little bit more detailed combat system. I know you can't see that, and that's unfortunate, but uh, this is a pretty poor photocopy of the, photocopy of the page. Anyway, they've added step losses, um, disruption, that type of thing. In the original rules, uh, blue and gray rules from SBI, there's a thing called uh, attacker effectiveness, something like that, whereby if you roll, uh, if you roll an attacker retreat or something like that, your unit is reduced in effectiveness for the remainder of the day. Yes, attack effectiveness is what it's called, 11.0. Um, basically, the unit uh, pretty much can't do anything but move and try to stay away from combat. Basically, it can't have any combat. This game, or in the uh, optional rules here for Elao, and I'm probably misspelling that name or mispronouncing it, so, you know, I make no apologies for that. Um, I can barely pronounce my own name and the names of places in my own uh, country, so, you know, that's how it goes. So, they introduce uh, disruption, which basically has most of the same effects as loss of uh, attack effectiveness and step losses. So, you know, I don't think it's that big a deal, but we'll see how it works in conjunction with the um, basic blue and gray rules. Um, let's see. I know this is kind of a boring static shot, but uh, cinema photography is probably not my major uh, major major skill I guess you would say. Took uh, basic photography in high school but that was 40 years ago so well, who knows. Uh, I'll try to set this shot up here a little bit better uh, in a minute and give you guys a better view of the uh, opening setup for both the Union and the Confederates. Um, and we'll go over some of the basic blue and gray rules and I'll Put that together uh, in another video here soon. So I'll be right back. Okay, back now. This gives a very basic, broad overview of the uh, the position of the units at the start of the battle. Union units are on the left. They occupy um, some pretty good defensive terrain. Um, and the Confederate forces are in the lower right hand corner of the screen. To the north lies, I'll get all these names wrong. Uh, let's see, Tennessee River of course. 
Jeez, you think I know my history a little better than that. And um, the game is 13 turns long. There's the first day of the battle and the second day of the battle. Uh, on the map, there's a place to put destroyed units. That's up there at the top into two white boxes. Um, and over to the right are the major charts and tables and terrain effects and the terrain effects key that you'll need to use to play the game. Um, like I may have stated before, just this camera, so sorry for the jerking. Um, we're going to use this, for the most part, the standard blue and gray rules. Um, let's see here for a second if I can get a decent example that you can see. And we'll try to get this in the, in the frame and some kind of focus. I know you probably can't see much, but the symbol, of course, is for infantry. I believe it's a brigade. It has a combat strength of six. And this unit is Jackson's brigade. So, I'll get back in focus of the camera here, maybe. Eh, there we go. Maybe a little bit better. Anyway, so each unit has some basic standard movement allowance of six movement points. Um, it uses these movement points um, to move across the map board one adjacent hex at a time, spinning these movement points to enter various types of terrain which have various types of costs. You subtract the cost from your movement allowance and when that reaches zero you have to stop moving or if you move adjacent to an enemy unit you have to stop moving so pretty much your basic standard uh, hex and counter war game let's see the sequence of play this is just a general sequence of play applies to most all the games in this system although there will be some special rules in the scenarios that uh, alter the sequence of play it's going to be divided up into two player turns, each of which will have several phases. The first player turn consists of a movement phase and a combat phase. And then there's a second player turn, which uh, has a movement phase and a combat phase. Then we have the game turn record interface, where we adjust the game turn record marker and stuff like that. Uh, movements pretty much self-explained. Uh, they're stacking of two units per hex. Um, I'm going to modify that just a little to reflect a little bit more historical um, deployment of units in that era. I am not allow I am not going to allow infantry and cavalry to stack together. However, infantry may stack with one artillery unit or a cavalry unit may stack with an artillery unit or two artillery units may stack together. So basically the restriction is on infantry and cavalry. They did not work together as a combined force in this era, and therefore they may not stack together to increase their combat strengths. Um, probably since all units in an enemy zone of control have to engage in combat, they will be allowed to um, participate in combat together. They just can't stack together. So most cavalry units are weaker than your basic infantry unit so not allowing them to stack with infantry units will mean that they'll have weaker stacks so I guess that's appropriate anyway moving on uh, we have zones of control as I mentioned units must stop when they enter an enemy zone of control and they may move no farther that turn the only way to uh, exit a hex in an enemy zone of control is by either retreating 
either you're retreated or the enemy is retreated or the enemy unit or you are destroyed so uh, kind of brutal brutal there but that's how that's how most of these beer and pretzel games t- kind of work combat is pretty much uh, pick a target hex uh, add up all your attacking strength points and divide that by all the defending strength points you'll come to a ratio of say you know one to one two to one three to one or even one to two one to three you'll roll a die and uh, you'll see what uh, happens uh, as a result of that combat as I said I'm going to use a different combat table and we'll see how that works out may work pretty good maybe a complete fiasco but I don't play these games for anyone's benefit but mine it's mostly for entertainment and some history and and just to understand the game system and game mechanics uh, the, by the designer you have diversionary attacks in which a weaker unit may attack a stronger unit while the rest of your attackers attack the main principal unit that they want to attack since all units that are adjacent to enemy units have to attack some other adjacent enemy unit uh, the diversionary attack is like a soak off uh, if I were to attack well let me get you a close up here and I can explain a few of these rules a little bit better uh, once you can see them up close so just a minute here okay I'm back um, just want to kind of give a little bit of an example of uh, movement zones control um, combat diversionary attacks that type of thing so we're going to use as an example these two confederate units against this one union unit I have a confederate infantry with a strength of six I have a confederate cavalry unit with a strength of three and I may throw in a nine up here um, you know I don't know what the odds are I just kind of fudge it okay so we have six movement points for the Confederates it's their movement phase um, clear is going to cost this one movement point so to have the cavalry move up here it enters this unit zone of control which consists of the six hexes uh, adjacent to it and continuing a movement with another unit that would be one and let's see if we can't throw in the nine we're going to use a road because there's a road that leads out of the hex well we'll see if we can get there um, but anyway you use the road movement from hex to hex if they're connected by a road symbol so let me see road should be one uh, road and it negates other terrain so it is a one normally moving through the woods is going to cost you or through the forest I guess they call it it's going to cost you three movement points <coughs> so we should be able to get there we're going to move this confederate unit one along the road ignoring the other terrain <coughs> however I could move him into here but then he has to stop moving because he is adjacent to an enemy zone of control and friendly units do not negate that zone of control so I'm going to move him uh, into the woods uh, not along a road so it's going to cost me three so all in all I spent one two three four movement points out of my six I'd have two more to spend however I have placed myself in an enemy zone of control and I may not move any farther now let's say that there were two Union units here okay he didn't get to move or anything let's say he was there when we just started this example okay now we're into combat phase I have to divide all my units up into combats against enemy units that are adjacent so I could have this unit 
this unit and this unit all attack this unit except I also have to attack this union unit so sorry if this is blurry but this is about the best I can do with the technology that I have available um, that moving back and forth really messes up the autofocus so I guess I could take that off but uh, probably just have so um, anyway so I have to divide this attack up into the Confederate 9 and the Confederate 6 versus the Union 5 and I have to divide the attack also the Confederate 3 versus the Union 5 now that's the only possible way that I could do it so to resolve combat We'll do it in the conventional sense using the uh, standard rules. This would be 9 plus 6 is 15, and we'll divide that by 5, giving us a 3 to 1 uh, ratio. Uh, rolling a die on the 3 to 1 table, um, which is going to be hard for me to show, and come back to that, but I'll just let you know that that's what it's going to be. The die roll is a 6, which is pretty extreme for this game system. 3 to 1, a 6, and probably the uh, worst possible result for the Confederates. It is an exchange. Now, an exchange works like this. The Union unit is eliminated. That's 5 points. Now, the Defender must eliminate at least 5 points or more to satisfy... Um, the exchange. Well obviously he doesn't want to lose the 9 uh, so that really only leaves the 6 as an option. So the 6 is eliminated um, for a bonus of basically plus 1 for the Union they get one extra one extra uh, Confederate casualty which is used uh, in the victory conditions. Um, now the attacker has the option to advance after combat. Any remaining uh, attacking units can advance. An advance would be just basically moving into there. The good thing about it, well, you can only move one uh, unit into an vacated into an vacated uh, hex as a result of advancing. Um, the positive of that is you can you can position your units to surround enemy units with their zones of control since you may not retreat into a hex occupied by an enemy uh, zone of control. So uh, we now re go to the second attack which is going to be a 3 to 5. Um, you're going to take 3 and you're going to divide it by 5 and round down which for those mathematical geniuses of you which have already figured it out <coughs> it's a 0 0.6 and we're going to round down to I believe uh, 1 to 2 in this case when you round down you'll always be getting a, a worse number basically if it's a negative to begin with so this attack will be at 1 to 2 basically <coughs> you can almost say it should probably be one to three that would be the next one but I'm gonna go one to two so we're gonna roll the die and this is the soak off part which probably should have occurred first but uh, it doesn't matter at the moment roll the five one to two it's an attacker retreat so probably his best option is to move into some defensive terrain now, does this game have Defender Advance after combat? Let me double check. Let's see. Whenever a hex is vacated as a result of combat, one victorious unit which participated in the combat may advance. Regardless of enemy zone of control, must be exercised immediately. Victorious unit movement. Doesn't seem to limit the attacker or the defender 
So if he chose, he could move into this hex, which would not be a particularly bright idea, since now he is surrounded completely by enemy zones of control. And he's in a clear hex, more units could be brought up against him, so his best bet would be to just remain uh, where he's at. So uh, when I come back, I'll explain artillery. Okay, welcome back. We're going to uh, talk about artillery in the blue and gray system. And then uh, we'll just touch upon some of the final rules, such as, oh, uh, what do we got? Uh, if I find my rules here, sorry about this. B-grade theater here. Um, there's just night game turns, the uh, optional rule of attacker effectiveness, and each individual scenario has its own special rules and victory conditions, which I'm uh, probably going to mess with right now. Okay, so artillery. Uh, make sure you can see these to some uh, effect. The Confederate artillery, um, all artillery units, artillery units, can uh, fire up to three hexes. So. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. They must do obey line of sight rules, which if I had a friendly unit here, they could not attack here or here because of the friendly unit or an enemy unit. So, um, that's basically it for line of sight. They can't fire through, um, I think woods are rough either. So, um, artillery can attack in two ways. They can bombard with the three hex range, or they can participate in combat uh, adjacent to enemy units, in which case they may not bombard. So, as an example of bombardment, um, we're going to attempt to fire I guess on this hex. Um, all units are combined for a um, total defense strength which in this era would be unrealistic because units uh, the more they uh, group together the greater their chances of being affected by artillery are. So um, these games are designed for playability first and historical accuracy second so you just have to accept those limitations and you know deal with it I guess so anyway this will be an attack of four versus a defense of eight and in this game woods have no effect on combat or force I guess you would call it no effect so you're basically looking at a one to two bombardment so we'll roll the two, we'll roll the dice on the one to two table, and we get a one. Very nice. It's a defender retreat. Both units have to retreat. They don't have to retreat to the same hex, I don't believe. Could be wrong on that. If I am, well, uh, forgive me, and I'll try to correct that during actual gameplay. So, there's no advance or anything like that. Um, the Confederate artillery just landed some good rounds that forced the Union to retreat. Okay, let's show the second part of uh, artillery. I'll put him back where he belongs, 0411, which I think is right here. His line of sight is blocked, but this artillery unit is not blocked. So let's say the Confederates had advanced one. Oh, let's go two. And they brought up the artillery as well for a ten. And let's say we brought up the nine again. One, two, three, four. And the 9 will attack the 5 and the artillery and infantry will attack the 5 here. Now, there's no defensive bombardment. Um, all units have to uh, 
the defending artillery would have to be adjacent to uh, provide any defense. Oops, sorry about that. <clears throat> kind of early in the morning, and I haven't had all my coffee yet, and I'm still a little bit on the wobbly side here. So, anyway, I'll wake up eventually. Um, in this case, we'll just, you know, 9 to 5, but he's in some very good defensive terrain. He's in wood force rough, uh, which is going to give him a double defense. So uh, it'd be like a 9 to 10 or 1 to 2. Not very good, but we'll go ahead and roll it out. I get a 3, 1 to 2, defender retreat, defender retreat, attacker retreat. So he just basically have to fall back. The attacker could advance if he wishes, but at this time he doesn't want to give up his good uh, defensive terrain. Now we'll uh, show how artillery works in adjacent combat. The only other attack to resolve now is versus him. He doesn't count anymore. He's already been attacked, uh, so he can be ignored. What we have here is the five in woods, which has no defensive uh, benefit. And we have a six and a four. The artillery can participate in this attack since it is adjacent. It just can't bombard. So here we have a two to one. We're going to roll the die. Normally you declare all of your attacks first and then you start to resolve them in any order the attacker wishes. So we roll a six. Uh, two to one. That is not good. That is an attacker retreat. In this game, artillery can retreat. Uh, normal. Retreat's always one hex. The defender could advance if he wishes, but so far his defensive line is holding pretty good, so he declines to advance after combat. And there you have it. That pretty much explains movement in combat and bombardment. Uh, the only other rules are, like I said, I think night turns. If I was using the, uh, and to some extent we will be, if once I use this uh, alternate combat results table, uh, which has disruption, uh, the similar role in uh, the regular blue and gray is attack effectiveness. Uh, Any time that the attacker would be forced to retreat, which was in this case, both units, they're flipped over and they basically become ineffective for the remainder of the turn until or the remainder of the game until a night turn. Uh, the effects of this are at the beginning of any friendly combat phase, friendly ineffective units in an enemy zone of control. Either all enemy units must be retreated in combat so that no enemy zone of control is an ineffective unit's hex. Or friendly ineffective hex must retreat according to the rules of retreat after combat. This does not allow the uh, optional advance. Ineffective unit which does not begin the combat phase in an enemy zone of control hex is not required to retreat. Uh, even if uh, due to the advance of enemy units after combat. The only way to recover is through a night game turn. Uh, at, during the, at the end of any night game turn all units are immediately flipped face up. So basically they rally and recover stragglers and that type of thing. So uh, that's pretty much it. Night game turns, there's no combat phase, units do not engage in combat, they just sit there, and movement restrictions during night game turns are identical to day game turn movement restrictions with one addition, units may not enter an enemy zone of control at night. So, that is the rules to the basic S and gray, uh, S and, what am I trying to say? Uh, SBI blue and gray game system. Now we have just a basic how do you win type of scenarios information. Uh, 
You get points for capturing hexes, eliminating units, and blocking enemy lines of communication. Shiloh, there are no lines of communication rules. Uh, the player who occupies hex 1508 at the end of the game gets 40. And that is basically up here by the Tennessee River. Has to do with, uh, 1408. There, 1508. Right here, I guess it is. Uh, that's where the ferry is. Um, where most of Grant's forces crossed uh, towards evening and during the night uh, to prepare for the attack on the Confederate positions later on the second day. Um, exiting units, units cannot exit the map in a Shiloh scenario. So it's basically eliminating uh, enemy units and capturing the one hex. And then you just total up all the values and see who wins. So, with that all said and done, I will reset the game and we will start with game turn one, probably tomorrow. So, until then, take care, be safe, and we'll see you then.